Regularly when I help newbies out with picking, they really struggle with the right feedback, the right tools, how does it fit the log, how much pressure do you use, and all these other kind of very logical and important questions when you just start out. In this video, I want to have a look at a Euro cylinder, how to turn that into a practice log to see if we can find the answers to those questions. And you're new to Logsport, maybe you're not interested to spend a ton of money on uh, you know, the perfect tools, the perfect practice logs, and all these kind of things. So if we have something like this, which is very common at least in uh, Europe and also in a lot of other places, how can we change this into something that helps you find those answers and take your first steps in the log picking world? First of all, uh, this is just one of the options. Uh, with a different log, you might be able to do the same thing. Second, I would like to see if we can do that with as minimal investments as possible, preferably a lock and stuff you have lying around anyway. What's important is that the lock has pins like this because we're going to take these out and that allows us to easily take the pins out and put them back and turn this into a practice cylinder. So in terms of materials, I will put more in the description about the uh, different options, etc. Because also after the video is out and I get uh, some comments and feedback, I am able to, uh, to update that. First thing we need to do is take this lock apart. So inside here you have the uh, hard plug that's basically uh, hammered in. Then you have a spring, the driver pin, the key pin, the key pin sits in the core, part of the driver also sits in the core. When you use the key, it pushes it to the right, uh, shear, to the right cutting off point between the core and the body, and that's why you can turn it. Uh, I will link to some interesting beginning videos about lock picking and uh, how a lock works uh, in the description as well. Now let's see how we can take this apart and then turn it into a practice lock. Uh, if you do have the tools, you can just cut this in half and uh, the whole operation will be much easier because you have much more access to uh, what you're doing. You can even create a follower, etc. Uh, you can use a pen or a piece of wood as long as it's the same size to push the core out. Uh, many videos show you how to do that. I will put something in the description. But now I'm assuming you have no tools, you have uh, no budget, you have nothing, uh, but you still want to practice. So. Let's keep the lock as it is and see what we can do. The first thing we're going to have to do is take these rings off. You see there are two, they hold the cores in the lock. And how this works is if you put the key in, then all the pins are at the right place. You can turn the lock, you can put it off when the ring is removed. And we're going to need that so that we can uh, uh, take the next steps. Now there are a few different types. This one turns around as you can see. You can see the opening coming back. Um, I already winded it a little bit. And uh, there are also types that go full circle and then you need a metal saw to cut it off like this. Just go slow. At some point the ring will come apart and you can pry it off. And there is one that doesn't turn around but has an opening. And typically you can take a piece of metal, piece of metal like this you can take, and you can basically take it in the hole push it right through and push the ring off on the other side. So with a screwdriver, you can basically push the ring a little bit apart. Typically the screwdriver is a bit thick and you're not able to get it fully off because it rotates. So one side you have to push down unless you use two screwdrivers, uh, but uh, the screwdriver gets jammed. But if it's loose a little bit, what you can do is take a pliers and try to pull it off on the other side. You see it's coming off. So with my nail I was pushing it to get a grip. Normally these ring, rings are uh, well, always annoying to take off, but uh, this one is uh, made from a much harder material than normal. So this one is more difficult to take off. Try not to break it. Try to just pry it off. I think we're pretty much there. Another thing that uh, works is 
you see how there are holes there in the core often. Often what also helps is uh, when you widen it a little bit, push one end a little bit inside so it gets stuck, and then you can push off the other side. You can see it gets stuck here with the cam, but that doesn't really matter. With pliers you can just pull it off anyway. There you go. So it's warped, but it's not really broken or anything. We can use it again. That's one off. And what I want to show you, if I now put in the key, be careful. Because if I pull, you see how the core is coming out? That's what we're going to use. So now when I want to take out the key, I have to hold it with my thumb. Don't forget, you might break the lock. Pull it out. And now the pins will keep the core in its place. We'll have to do the same on the other side to take this middle piece off. This is easier because there's a wider gap. You see how now it's sticking out a little bit. And that's ring number two. Now what we can do is take the two keys that we have. I can pull the lock out a little bit. Don't pull it too far because pins will start to fall out. Just enough to take this middle piece off. Normally you have to uh, remove both of the cores a little bit to do that. I'll take the other key with both keys in. Why does this key doesn't work? So with both keys in, very carefully, I can pull this core out a little bit and I can pull the other one out a little bit. Pulling it too far will basically give problems in the lock, so don't do that. And now with a bit of wiggling, I can take the middle piece out. Here you have the cam, so with a bit of jiggling, this uh, middle part uh, will go in the middle and you're able to remove it. Now before we do anything wrong, let's push this back, hold it with your thumb, pull the keys out and then we'll take it to the next step. Alright, so the middle part is removed, that means we can take the core out. Now, you see there's a gap here, and this gap is in most locks smaller than the pins inside here. So in most cases you will be able to just take the core out without too much issues. That's not the case for all locks. So in your lock I cannot guarantee that this will work. Uh, there is a chance that one of the pins here shoots in this gap and then it can be hard to open the lock and use it again. Um, there is a chance that if you rotate the core a little bit the pin will basically drop out from this hole over here, then you rotate the core back and then you take the core out further. So in uh, many cases there is also a way out, but not always. Furthermore, in the core there might be holes somewhere along the side here in, the, in this uh, rotating core part. Pins can shoot out there. Uh, if that happens there is no way uh, in many cases to uh, get your lock functioning again. So what I like to do in these cases, it's just rotated a little bit with the key, 
because the holes are typically a bit more on the side. And if you just rotate it a little bit, you can just pull the core out. Now we'll do that slowly and stuff will come out on all sides, uh, but that's the point. Uh, that's not a problem at all. So here you see the first pin already. That's the key pin. You see how I just have it at a slight angle. So that key pin we can already get out. There you go. This is in pin one. I don't have a pinning tray now, but that's okay. We'll just keep pulling. At some point, something will shoot out of the back. There we go. And it's a very nice pull. Maybe that's the reason why we couldn't pick this lock. And just keep pulling. There's the second key pin. I keep pulling. Something will shoot out of the back. There we go. Another nice pull. Wow, this must be a really challenging lock for our beginner. So it's good we turn it into a practice lock instead. Note that the pins that come out from the back, I will put in this sequence and the pin that come out in the front in this sequence so that we have matching pairs later. Another key pin. Something shot out. Another spool. I keep the angle the same, I'm not rotating it further. Key pin. Something shooting out from the back. Standard pin. Keep pulling it out slow. Last key pin. A spring. A spring, a spring, a spring, another spring, another spring. This is an extension from this part by the looks of it. Don't need it anymore. Another spring. And let's see if we have all the pieces. So the lock is disassembled. Here we have the key pins. Here we have the driver pins, and here we have the springs. In this case, it's a five pin lock. So we have five key pins, five drivers, and five springs. And that's pretty typical for a European style lock. You see, you can just place the pins on the table and uh, basically that's fine. If you want to be more organized, feel free to fold a piece of paper. Then you can nicely keep track of what you're doing. There you go, that's more organized. And now we can see exactly what we're up against and what pins we have to build our practice lock. I wanted to add a quick note on pin stack height. On the right, you see the pins that we took out and on the left, there's a diagram of how they could sit in the core. A few things are important to note here. Most of it uh, is just you know, for your information, you can ignore it for now. Uh, but there is one situation that you really want to avoid. Maybe two, that depends on you. On the right, you can see that the pins have different heights. The key pins have different heights, but also the driver pins have different heights. On the left, in the diagram, you can see how they could look like in the core. Now, the first two chambers are perfectly fine. That's basically what you want. And what you see there is that the longer key pins are matched with the shorter driver pins, so that the total stack height is about equal. In the third chamber, you can see how a very long driver pin is added to a very long key pin. That in itself is not really a problem, but it can mean that if you have a key with a particular cut, where the key is basically very wide, then pushing that in the core with such high long pins in it and the spring it can be that the whole stack cannot move up sufficiently for the key to enter and exit smoothly. That's not a problem because anyway, uh, we take out the caps, so you can just remove it from the top and, uh, and that's not really an issue. But if the key doesn't go in and out smooth, that could be the case. Now the fourth chamber is more interesting. 
and that one is the one with caution. You can see how a very small key pin is combined with a very small driver pin. And as a result, you can see here, the combination is not long enough to go above the hole in the core. As a result, the spring will basically sit inside the core. That means if you're picking, it can very easily happen that with the turning pressure you put on the core, if you pick the other pins, but not chamber four, that you turn the core while the spring is in it, and that's the only thing preventing the core from turning, it will get crushed and you cannot use it again. And basically now you have a four pin lock instead of a five pin lock. So that's something to avoid. So make sure that if you put the key pin and the driver pin in the core, that at least the driver pin sticks out of the core. As you can see in chamber one, two, three, and five. Five has something peculiar, and that might be the case for the lock that you took apart. It has an extra element in it, the gray one. That's a master wafer. It's unrelated to wafer locks, but what it means is that we have two moments when if you push the last key pin up, that the cut between the pins matches with the cut between the core and the body. The line between green and gray, or the line between the yellow orangey and the gray. That means two keys can operate this lock. Master keying, hence master wafer. Now, basically you can leave the master wafers out. Uh, you don't want them in picking because they just make picking easier because you have more shear lines. But what you can see here, and that's the main point I wanted to uh, address here, that it can be in one of your chambers you end up in situation number four, where the total pin stack is below the height of the core. In that case, you can add a master waiver to push that up, and that means it's still safe for picking. Now that we've done this, let's move on with building our practice lock. The lock is empty on this side, let's hammer these pins out. Basically we need something that will push the pins out, that will be wide enough so the pin doesn't deform much, because otherwise it gets wedged and it's hard to get it out. So pretty much the size of this pin, but smaller than the chamber it is in, and something that's strong enough uh, basically to be able to push it through. What I found works really well is to take a nail, Take the head of the nail with a file, or with a saw, or something. And you can see, that basically meets all the, the criteria that we want. It's strong enough, it's long enough, the size is good, it's flat, and this we can use to hammer it out. So let's do that next. I'm going to do this on the floor to make sure that I don't damage my table. I'll put a block under it, so that I don't damage the floor. Uh, this is much easier in a vise, but uh, we're doing this low tech, so here we go. Basically what I want to do is hold this in its place. Take my hammer and just drive it through. All right, and we're through. It takes quite some hammering, but it's possible. And here you see the tiny pin that comes out. We're not gonna be reusing them, but it's good to keep at least one of them for the size. I'll get back to that later. So like this, we just hammer out all the pins. And we're through.
and that's all the pins hammered out. After all the violence, basically we are left with an empty core. In another video I've already shown you how to make a flashlight like this, but here I just use it to show you that it's really empty. And with this we can now repopulate the lock. If you want to know uh, how to repopulate the lock with the pins in the right place for the key to function, then this is a good moment because the core is still loose and later we're going to attach it to the body again. Basically what you do, you take these pins put them like you think they were the sharp side of it goes towards the key and if all of them are in the right place you can see they're flush with the core nothing sticks out nothing sinks in then you know the key should work We can put this inside and now we can start populate the chambers on top. Obviously when you are using this as a practice lock you can start with just one chamber and leave, leave all the rest empty. So if you look at the sequence now first we have the key pins in place then we put in the driver pins Then we put in the springs. Then if we jiggle it a little bit, put some pressure on it. Keep your finger on the core when you remove the key. Jiggle it a little bit and you see everything falls in. The lock doesn't turn anymore and basically you have a functional lock except that everything will fall out of the top and there is no spring pressure on it. That's the next part. So where we are now is that we have removed these caps and as a result the springs stick out and fall out. There is no pressure on the springs because normally these are pushed further inside due to these caps. We need to replace them with something that is easy to put in and remove and put in and remove because we're making a practice lock. Now, basically what I found is that in uh, many of these uh, sized chambers you can basically use a piece of electrical wire, the plastic of it, so that it's easy to take out because you can just put a lock pick inside and pull it out or it just falls out anyway. Uh, but you can see here uh, this size doesn't work. So let's see if we can use a thinner size in full creativity. So. Here I have a black one that's smaller and that fits the chamber. So we're going to cut some small pieces from this uh, without the metal inside. Pretty much the size of that pin can be a little bit longer, can be a little bit shorter. It's not an exact size. I cut a few of them off, so uh, this is pretty much the size we're looking for. Doesn't have to be exact, but you can see it's pretty much the size of the pin with a little bit extra because the pins were not on the top. Plus, uh, with the hammering, we reduced their size a little bit. So we take our pinned lock and basically we can push these inside and they should go in pretty smooth and be easy to remove. There you go, that doesn't take any effort at all, so it's pretty much good. You see the spring pushes them out, so basically that's a good sign, then they're the right size. Can be a bit smaller, but 
We don't want the spring to be supported. That's basically it. Like this, we can put all the caps in place. And next, we can use a clamp, like this paper clamp or something else, to keep everything in place. With the key, we now have a functional lock. But let's keep in mind that C-clip is not on. So keep your thumb on it when you pull the key out. Otherwise, stuff goes everywhere. You can put it back together if you can find stuff. So let's look at this C-clip next. I already put one on. I bend it a bit more straight. Now the easiest way to put it back because the cam is removed is place it basically like this, push it on. You see it's already almost the right size and now we can just clamp it back in its place. I'm using way too blunt pliers for it, but this is low tech, so here we go. There you go, it's not perfect. Uh, taking more time and using smaller pliers uh, makes it very easy to put it back. But it works, now we have a functioning lock. The key goes in and out, and we can start picking. Next I will show you how to do this in a few different ways. First of all, when you're in this position, you have a few different options. If you don't have a paper clamp, use some folded paper, put it on top. Take any rubber band. And this will work for you. I will show you uh, what you can do to make this much better, but then you need the right tools for it. So basically what we need is something about this size that is easy to put in and take back out. One of the nicest solutions that you can use if you have that option is to thread it and use grub screws like this. You can see on one side you have a hex screw, on the other side it's flat. So this is perfect because it will keep the pins in. It's the right height. You can easily take it out and put it back in chamber by chamber. This works really well, and that's why pretty much all the uh, commercial practice locks have something like this. How does that work? Well, you take a tap, if you have one. I normally use an M4 that works well for me. One of these guys, slowly you thread it. And your threaded chamber, you can use to put the grub screws. You just need to thread it for the length of pretty much this that you took out, plus a little bit more so that the grub screw nicely fits in. If you have trouble getting the grub screws, you can also use something else. You can use a piece of bolt. I cut it off. Cut a small groove in it, so now with a normal screwdriver, I can take it in and out. Uh, if you don't have a bolt, you can also just use a piece of thread wire like this for it. That all works well, but you do need the tools. If you don't have the tools, then this basically works perfectly fine. And when you know you really like lock picking, you can always upgrade to something better. So there you go. Here you have your very low tech, very low budget, uh, just starting with lock picking, practical training lock. So I hope this helps anybody. Um, I will uh, leave a few links below of other videos uh, with follow-ups. For example, Lockmoop had a very nice video where he shows you how to make a cutaway, also with very basic tools. 
But this shows you that in a few minutes with very, very basic tools, if you're just new to Logspot, absolutely it's possible to create a practice log and you can practice your log picking with a log that's basically still above your skill level. But with practice, you'll get there, you'll get it open. That's why we kept the other side as it was. Thanks for watching. Take care.